everybody, Raul here for Bass Musician Magazine, and today we have the great honor and pleasure of chatting with Dr. Randy Kurtz. You've seen Dr. Kurtz for years now, so many highlighted videos, and he's talked a lot about prevention and bass players specifically. So much of this applies to everyday life, but bass players are an area because we both play bass, so this is a great area of interest to us. In addition to that, Dr. Kurtz is the author of The Basis Guide to Injury Management, Prevention, and Better Health, Volumes 1 and recently Volume 2. So yes. those are also great resources. The topic we want to talk about isn't as much prevention, although that can always play into it, but it is pain management and some thoughts about pain management. One of the important things when it comes to pain management, I like to think of ourselves kind of like race cars you need to have a support team. You have to have your pit crew that helps you stay in the race. And us as the driver of our very complex vehicle, we need to make the decisions when to go see our pit crew or what we need to do at a particular moment. And so there's going to be instances where it's an acute problem, where we've done something and we have a result. We want to know how to deal with that. And there's going to be instances where they're kind of a chronic issue that maybe something was going on and we didn't realize what was happening until now it hurts us and it bothers us constantly. And I know most people are very familiar with over-the-counter pain medications. You know, we've all seen them. Aspirin being the granddaddy of them all. Uh, following with your other non-steroidals, Motrin, Nuprin, Advil, kicking into Tylenol. Uh, as an alternative that doesn't have the gastrointestinal bleeding. And part of the issue that I always mention with any of your medications, your pills that you ingest, they have other effects. And so none of them are absolutely harmless. Granted, some of them have less damaging effects, but if you live on aspirin, you're going to have some issues. If you live on Tylenol, you're going to have some liver problems. So those are issues. And then, of course, we're all familiar with the opioids, the narcotics, these are great for moderate to severe pain. However, you've got the risk of addiction, and then that has a whole other series of problems that you definitely want to avoid. So when you have somebody like Randy here, and you're having you know, a pain issue, so let's say you're at your house and you, you're, something's happened, you've decided you need some help, now, we want to get some insight from, from Dr. Kurtz as to some advice on pain management and his thoughts. Okay. Uh, well, good to be with you today, as always. Some thoughts on pain uh, management in general. As far as taking some kind of a pill goes, there's going to be an opioid category. There's going to be a supplement category. There's going to be an over-the-counter, like an NSAID type of category. Mm -hmm. And these things all have their time and their place, but when they're used excessively or in the wrong time or place, that's when you end up with problems. For example, if you're taking NSAIDs, that's general. We're talking about aspirin. We're talking about acetaminophen. We're talking about ibuprofen, etc. Mm -hmm. You're generally taking them for a reason, meaning, wow, I've got a headache. Wow, I've got some inflammation. Wow, I've got some discomfort here. Okay, well and good in the early stages of said incident, if appropriate. But if you keep not NSAID, but rather, I guess I could have used a better choice of words there, of the incident, yes. shall we say. But if the taking of these things becomes a habit, that is not doing anything for what the underlying problem is. And it would behoove one to find out what the underlying problem is before taking something uh, again and again and again unnecessarily becomes an additional problem. Mm -hmm. And you're masking the original issue, which is simply getting worse because you're just blocking pain receptors so you continue on your merry way, and then you end up perhaps with a stomach ailment or something similar because you keep taking these things. And, and what, what I do, as you know, is try to talk about prevention through awareness of what you may be doing wrong overall, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a child taking piano lessons or a musician uh, thrust into the mix where they're playing three sets a night, six nights a week, and they have to keep the train rolling, or at the lesson, the 
person giving the lesson, whether it's a nun or a uh, uh, the local person at the music store or whatever, perhaps not having uh, or being skilled in the area of injury prevention or being of the mindset that, hey, I did it this way and you just keep plowing through and you're going to have to do it too, which thankfully is becoming less and less. So it's more of a, a knowledge issue. Mm -hmm. It's the old trick was basically ice it until the next day and hope that you know you could keep going for another 10, 15 years and make some money. Yeah. And this is what people did forever. It's only up until recently that people have any interest at all in things like what we talk about, injury prevention, pain management, et cetera, et cetera. It's just go until you can't anymore. Mm -hmm. So prevention and awareness are the keys to everything that I do. I I can fix your carpal tunnel or I can fix your back perhaps or I can fix whatever problem happens to be bothering you but my value is going to show you is going to be rather in showing you how to avoid having these problems happen again whether it's the angle that you're keeping your wrist at when playing or plucking or fretting or how high you wear the instrument or your general posture or any one of a number of things so prevention and awareness are, are really where it's at at the crux of it because if you get to something early then you can perhaps keep it from happening again once it's resolved and it may not even turn into a problem once you correct something that may be causing a problem so part of that is as we have talked about in the past getting a proper diagnosis if you go to and, and as part of your team concept that you said if I have a team of people and I have pain in my wrist and I go see my heart doctor, it's not reasonable to expect them to know what's going on with my wrist, mm -hmm. especially in this. And, and they may, with all great intent or not, say, OK, well, take some aspirin or go see this person. And they yeah. write you a script to go see someone else because everybody specializes these days. So and it doesn't make them bad people sometimes maybe. Maybe, uh, <laughs> if, uh, but but you know, if you go see the wrong person, expecting a different outcome or a certain diagnosis. Mm -hmm you may not get what you need. I always recommend to anybody, if you play an instrument and you're having some kind of pain whilst playing the instrument or after, and you're concerned about that, and you don't know where to go, so you go to your general doctor who's in your, your insurance plan, bring your instrument with. And, to, and and call them up and tell them, don't just show up with a tuba in the office because nobody's going to like that, okay? <laughs> but call them up and say, hey, I'm a musician. I have wrist pain. I'm not sure what it is. I want to see the doctor. And I want them to see what it is that I do. So maybe they can say, okay, you're doing this wrong and you're doing this. Or you could try doing this. Mm -hmm. Because a general physician may be skilled enough to say, oh, you know what? You're bending your wrist a lot and that really looks uncomfortable. Did you try straightening out a little bit? That kind of thing. Sometimes you get lucky and you find a, a practitioner who's also a musician. Somebody who comes and sees me, for example, I can not only look at them from a mechanical point of view, but also I know that if I tell them to straighten out their wrist, then and they then put out their shoulder to 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 do that right yeah. they're straight they they're, they're bending their wrist like that while they're plucking and then you ask them to straighten it out and they don't get the connection that there can be flexibility there and they alter their shoulder now we're talking about another problem yeah. so you look at it one way and you make sure the musician knows that I'm not trying to change the way you do things or do anything or 30 years of technique down the drain or any of that stuff. Yeah. Just by doing a couple little things or maybe even breathing or dropping your shoulders is going to really do one a world of good. Gotcha. Well, and it's, it's interesting when you talk uh, about the ways of the past. And again, we've been gaining knowledge as far as pain. And again, pharmaceutical companies are going on. If you go back to ancient times, headaches. If you were an Aztec warrior and you had a headache, 
you would go to your medicine man and what they did is they would trephinate. They would use an obsidian chisel and open a hole yeah. in your skull because yeah. by their appraisal, if you have pain in your head and it feels like there's pressure in there, opening a hole should solve the problem. Now, Leave the pressure. Yeah. Ca countless skulls later that have been found in archaeological digs have shown that even if that might have re resolved the pressure at the moment, the patients didn't survive the procedure due to a brain surgery with no anesthetic and the use of obsidian chisels, uh, rudimentary right. tools at best. And so they find countless skulls with unhealed square holes in them going, yeah. oh, this guy must have had a headache. So that, that must have <laughs> been the problem. And so as a chiropractor, I know yes. that a lot of the focus has to do with the alignment of our spine and mm -hmm. kind of the positional things. But you add to this, you have a training doing acupuncture as well that has a whole different philosophical approach to kind of what is going on with the flow of chi kind of up and down our bodies and a different, less mechanical interpretation. Sure. My training in acupuncture is limited to the use of acupuncture. I, I am not a doctor of oriental medicine and I don't prescribe herbs. Mm -hmm. Acupuncture as taught in the United States and much of the world is based primarily on treatment patterns, which have been shall we say, tweaked over the years for various reasons, some in translating texts, some in changes in regime in, in countries where this was primarily used and the, the practitioners were told to bring their styles together for a standardized form of medicine. There's a lot of things that go into how people practice acupuncture, gotcha. um, but generally it's based on treatment patterns which are learned through a book and through education. OK, the acupuncture that I mostly do is based on what I find. So I use it much like a treatment modality, meaning if I'm trying to find tightness in muscles and relieve that, I will find knots in muscles and I will release those through needling, which is sometimes a better approach than adjusting someone or putting stimulation on someone or doing ultrasound or doing modalities which work well much of the time, but sometimes the body, especially if it's really tense and it's spasming, it's really tender at certain spots, it's going to respond to these things by tightening up further to protect itself. That's mm -hmm. what the body does. So sometimes the needling is a good way to loosen up knots in muscles, which will release them. They'll go back to their normal length and function, and one will go about their business which is the basic core of acupuncture, which as you point out, talks about a substance that flows through the body that provides energy called chi. The basic tenets of acupuncture are if this chi is not flowing properly through channels of the body called meridians, there's a blockage somewhere, which is where the acupuncture points come in. So if there's a blockage somewhere, you may have some kind of dis-ease, which could be a muscle tightness, it could be a headache, it could be your liver is about to burn, your, uh, not your liver, but let's say your gallbladder is about to burn. Yeah. It could be a lot of different things. It could be an internal medicine issue. Mm -hmm. A lot of different things could come into play. So the belief is that by releasing the blockage in the meridian of the chi through stimulating an acupuncture point, that releases and the chi flows and everything is wonderful again. So that's a theory of Chinese medicine. However, it can be extrapolated easily to Western medicine because if you study the meridian, the channels where the chi is supposed to flow through the body, if you study that system, it correlates many times with nerve systems, sympathetic nerve chains, and other Western structures, which we have the benefit of knowing about because we have opened up bodies, 
for cadavers for dissection, and we uh, can take images of bodies and we can identify structures, mm -hmm. whereas when the original acupuncture and Chinese medicine studies were being performed, it was via eyesight. Yeah. It was via observation because they believed that to cut open the body was to desecrate the body of the ancestor. So they made uh, their system of medicine through observation, which is really remarkable. But in through the years, through the centuries, this has changed as it should in, in some ways, and some things have been brought with and some have been left behind. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole dialogue about this, but essentially certain things need to change and certain things shouldn't have changed. And here we are. But essentially, if I, if I'm going to practice acupuncture on somebody, I usually stay in my lane, which means I do musculoskeletal issues. If you come to me and you say, you know, I went to my, and this has happened to me. My heart doctor says I need this medicine to stay alive, but I don't want to take it. I want you to do acupuncture on me, and I know you, so I trust you, so you do acupuncture. Hey, I'm not your guy. I got news for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is not a good thing to do, in my opinion which in this case, uh, I, I, you know, I stand by. Yeah. But to, uh, to sort of get to the bottom of it, if you, if, if you come in and you've got uh, pain in your shoulders and I figure out that it's not caused by any sort of pathology and you just need to relax a little bit, I can treat those knots perhaps with acupuncture, mm -hmm. release them, they will go back to their normal length that theoretically will take the blockage away and you can call it your circulation, you can call it chi, you can call it meridians, you can call it nerve change, you can call it whatever you want. But essentially I'm taking care of the problem, I'm releasing it, and then I'm gonna teach you how to breathe and how to do relaxation things to help to avoid this problem from coming back again. Got you. Well, and other helpful members of the team with a similar thing because especially professional musicians, they know they're going to be re doing the repetitive action that caused their discomfort and they can take some corrective action, but they're still doing what it is that brought them to that. So like if you are the tuba player and then you go, well, screw this, I'm taking up piccolo from here on out, you're yeah. going to be, you, that will resolve the issue, but you've, lo you've left your, lost your ability to play the tuba. That's right. With the musicians, if they know that they're doing this, you know, so many gigs a night and they're doing, you know, it, it's just they accept that this is comes with the turf, this yes. ache. And granted, they come to get treatment because they feel enough discomfort that they go, OK, I need to go see somebody. But also from a maintenance point of view, things like routine massage therapy, like yeah. for the tightness of the back and getting those muscles worked out. And I think a lot of people, when we think of massages, I know I had, when I went for my first massage, I'm kind of going, oh, that, 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 that's, that's just fluff. This is just a luxury, a spa day, mm -hmm. whatever. But mm -hmm. when you have a good therapeutic masseuse, they actually can do an awful lot to help with that musculature. And so you're going, wow, I, I, I do feel a lot better. And even with my chiropractor, I was getting massage therapy prior to getting adjusted because it would release things and allow the adjustment to happen in a more efficient fashion instead of uh, her fighting against my body. Things were already a little more relaxed or again, the use of acupuncture to work down some of those knots and things. Other health professionals, and I, and I always encourage people to get as much information as possible because yeah. as, as you were saying, you would steer away from managing somebody's heart disease, but well-intended physicians, especially with Western medicine, they, they tend to like to look at things with a set of blinders because it's the way we're trained. That's and right. so you might have, if you went to your physician with back pain, they might say, here, take, take Motrin, take two aspirin and call me in the morning. They mm -hmm. may not say, do you have a good chiropractor you can go to? Or have you had any massage therapy? And other modalities that I know people have some sex, like uh, craniosacral therapy, reflexology, Reiki, energy healing. Now people will start going, oh, that's really woo-woo. You know, was it uh, Area 54? <laughs> 
kind of <laughs> hands-on biblical stuff, but there, there's some foundation to a lot of these modalities. There is, but but there needs to be critical thinking as well. As uh, we're talking in our conversation here about being open-minded to certain kinds of medicine too, any healer in any all the way uh let, let's say in any aspect of of healing whether it's surgery or or massage or or uh, whatever whatever it may be mm-hmm. and they are uh, industries are rife with people who are happy to take your money and are not skilled maybe at what you're trying you trying to accomplish with your tuba or just in general so one does need to do research and ask questions and trust themselves a bit to try to sort this out. Because otherwise you go, I'm, I'm amazed, for example, at the number of people that come to see me from other chiropractors. Uh, and they may say, oh, this happened and that's it. And I can't believe that they would go to another chiropractor after that experience, because mm-hmm. I sure wouldn't. You know what I mean? Because if you go somewhere and you have a bad experience, and this is the same with restaurants or lawyers or whatever it might yeah. be, you go somewhere, you have a bad experience, you may be soured to the whole the whole idea, the whole profession, and rightfully so. And whether that's people's intent to defraud or whether that's a lack of competence or all of the above, right? It happens. So yeah, I encourage people to ask questions. And the best way to ask questions is to call the practitioner up and ask them if they think they can help you. Mm-hmm. And if they say something to along the line and they if they don't want to talk to you or you end up talking to somebody else or getting a less than satisfactory answer, you can't get a diagnosis just cold calling over the phone. But sure. if you get something that sounds plausible and not just come on in and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and or it feels like you're getting blown off a bit, what's it going to be like when they've got you? You know, mm-hmm. so they work for you. I work for you. Interview me, ask me, I'll tell you at some point, I'll probably say, that's all I can tell you until you come and see me. But I will say, I see a lot of cases like this. This sounds like something I'm good at. Come see me. Or no, I do not treat heart disease with chiropractic. (laughs) Some might, more power to you. I don't. Go see your heart doctor. That's my recommendation. Thanks for calling. You know, it's that simple. It, it, there's nothing mystical necessarily about it. The healing process can be amazing and can be wonderful and can just blow your mind day in and day out at, at, its, at the body's efficiency and healing capacity and, and all that kind of thing. But it all needs to make some kind of sense. We talked about acupuncture. I can tell people about acupuncture. I can lecture for hours about the history of acupuncture or, and, or you know, some of the high points we just talked about, or I can get in a room full of surgeons and explain to them, and similarly to what I did you, how all these concepts make sense from a quote unquote Western science point of view and make you say, oh, okay, I get that. Let me try that, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Well, and there is resistance, and that I think we still we still find that again. It goes back to when we're being trained, we're told this is the right way, and it is kind of the only way. And yeah. the more life experience we have, we start gaining more a little more momentum. And so, by the virtue of talking with other people, so like you're a musician and you talk to other musicians. So, for example. I'm a bass player. I'm having some back problems. I talked to my friend who also plays bass. He says, oh, I see Dr. Kurtz. He's been able to help me. That is a helpful tip and kind of the old school way of so-and-so said, I had the similar issue. I went to see so-and-so and and they were greatly helpful. And I, I totally agree. Not all chiropractors are the same. I remember the first chiropractor I went to made me think of Monday Night Wrestling (laughs) <laughs> because he he would fling himself across the room and come down with the elbows and I was on the mat and I'm getting pounded and it was it was I'm like okay I I, I do feel kind of better but by the same moment it's a little traumatic and yeah. then I when my next chiropractor who is a female wonderful what I noticed is she applied 
kind of brain over brawn. She is probably, I don't know, 120 pounds wet. She yeah. wasn't depending on her physicality, but how strategically can yeah. I work things to help you? And so yeah. I never felt like I was being mauled by Hulk Hogan or anything right. when I was going in for that particular treatment. But I'm also sure that there were people that if, you know, it was just the question of getting things aligned, what he was doing was giving him some results. It just wasn't necessarily right for me. That's exactly right. And, the, and an important thing which relates to all this is what you just said. What resonates with one may not resonate with another. You may react very well to acupuncture and not well at all to a chiropractic adjustment or vice versa. It's simply what resonates with you, with the individual. So that's part of it because if acupuncture works really well, but you hate needles and you're just not going to let, and you're just going to tense up and you're not going, you're doing it because your spouse made you come there, but you don't like it and you don't want it. And you know, it's not going to work. Guess what? It's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the other side of it, we talk about placebo. Now placebo is an interesting thing. A placebo meaning something that's supposed to be something Something that it's not. For example, I tell you, I've got the magic pill here that's going to cure everything that ails you, mm -hmm. and it's a sugar pill. But I am so good at expressing it, and I've given you such a good rap that you say, "Yeah, Randy, that's right, man. I'll take it, and you'll take it." Oh boy, oh, I could feel it working already. Yeah. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Now, on one hand, if it's meant to defraud, this is obviously a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty out there that's meant to defraud, especially in this arena that we're talking about. But by the same token, if your state that you've gotten yourself into over decades through misdiagnosis, through being tense, through being nervous, through stress, and a lot of other things and everybody has failed you and for some reason you buy into what I've got and I do something for you that is going to help you and I just do it a little differently maybe and in a helpful way and that works for you and it lowers your blood pressure and makes you feel better is that is it a bad thing? Am I a bad person because I did that, but I lowered your blood pressure yeah. because I got you to relax and de-stress where nobody else was able to do that? Okay, these are answers that we have to sort of ask ourselves, you know, but do placebo, again, do placebos get a bad rap in that regard? Is everything just a placebo? I just have to figure out how to make you relax and get better, right? Yeah. That Or in, in that kind of instance, you know, not heart disease, but well, if the blood pressure's high, it could be heart disease too, True. right? If, if I remember when I went to school, I was told, get this, I was told yeah. in a junior college, college biology class decades ago, I, I didn't know anything, right? I, I knew how to order a hamburger, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, and I went in this biology class knowing nothing about biology, and the teacher made us all take our blood pressure and said, okay, okay, you see what that is? Okay, that's your blood pressure. You're never going to be able to lower it uh, unless you, you get you have to take some certain kind of medicine, blah, 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 blah. But you can't lower your blood pressure. It will only go up. And I didn't know anything, but I thought that doesn't sound right to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I have patients come and see me all the time that I treat with acupuncture, that I treat with chiropractic, whatever it might be. But part of that and going back to the prevention theme of all this is, OK, I may do something physical that helps you to relax. I may put you in a room by yourself for 20 minutes, and that's the only 20 minutes you get all week to be able to be by yourself and relax and breathe a little bit. But nevertheless, if I can lower your blood pressure, which I I'm doing right now for several patients and I have done for many others, mm -hmm. then I can say, call your doctor, tell them what we're doing, give them this set of readings that we took over the last couple of weeks and ask them if you can perhaps 
come off of your blood pressure medicine a little bit at a time or lower it. And usually they will do that and the doctor will be more than happy to comply and everybody works together. And guess what? You don't have to take some pill with a lot of side effects that you would have had to take your whole life likely. And we've really accomplished something there. So that's that's prevention. <laughs> absolutely. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned a placebo effect because you're absolutely right. It is something that starts, I'll say, even all the way from the pharmaceutical companies when they're selecting a name for a product. There used to be a pain medication named Zomax. Yeah. And it had the kind of name that when you handed somebody, I'm going to give you a prescription for Zomax, that's going to help you. Right. Whether it did or not, with a name like Zomax, you're going to go, oh, man, he's giving me Zomax. I am yeah. going to improve. Yes. And so that belief portion was important. Now, Zomax, unfortunately, had some fatalities, and they pulled it from the market after the fact. But it was very accepted, and a lot of people really liked it. They thought it was pretty good. But how much of that was the name when you told people you're going to have Zomax and you're going to feel better? And yes. if so fact, you are. Another yeah. point is, I'll call it the point of frustration. And it, it is one of the challenging things because healthcare providers are people too. And as such, they don't always have all of the answers. And mm -hmm. I would be more than happy and I would respect the healthcare provider that when I go in and, and say, this is what's going on, if they look at me and say, you know, I don't know what the problem is. That's right. And let's keep looking. Let me see yep. what I can find out. Maybe I can ask around. But I find that many healthcare professionals, they feel that if they admit they don't know something, they're going to lose face to the mm -hmm. patient. And yeah. so immediately they want to spout out three possibilities. And yep. sometimes some of those could be terrible. You know, it's the same way. Your tuba player goes in. And your, your doctor doesn't know why it is, and he decides to tell you you could have carcinoma of the clavicle or something. Well, now you're freaked out because you have cancer, and you know, you're, this is, it's, it's crazy. And, and now you're all upset, and it isn't until you see somebody else, they go, no, no, you don't, you're fine. You have a muscle sprain, or you have a postural thing. So with that, there's a very common modality too, with access to the internet, people self-diagnosing, people coming mm -hmm. to conclusions of their own because they have two of the five symptoms that are listed. And now all of a sudden, again, they do have uh, a terrible malady or something. And so I encourage people to go to folks that have more experience than that. And, and if they tell you, I don't know, don't give up there. Keep searching for the answer. And again, consider the alternatives. There's just so many companies that will tell you we can solve this. A classic area for musicians is tinnitus. Mm -hmm. Tinnitus, you know, to my understanding, and you see it a lot, anytime any of us have gone to one of our concerts and we've left, we enjoyed the concert, but you get home, you lie down in the bed, and your ears are still ringing from yeah. that, the, the last... <laughs> round yeah, right. of, right. you know, yeah. whoever. And the next day you wake up and it's gone and you go, okay, that was just the concert and this is fine. Yeah. Um, as we age and not necessarily into old, old age, but many people, a, a significant amount of Americans suffer from tinnitus. And as a musician, this can be a real issue. I know that prominently what Huey Lewis from Huey Lewis in the news was having yeah. tinnitus and it was kind of a career ending Malady, And so yeah. right now, there are a lot of people that say, oh, we can cure this. There's exercises. There's acupressure points for tinnitus. There are people that have drops. There's the latest I saw. There's some CBD gummies that they were saying they could help with tinnitus. But there's a really good TED Talk where they're talking about it being a central nervous system, kind of like if you stare at a bright light constantly, you're going to end up with like a little dot in your retina. And ear-wise, kind of the same thing. After hearing years and years and years of stuff, you might end up with kind of a little blind spot mm -hmm. that your brain tries to fill the space. The brain doesn't like empty spaces, and so it tries to fill with a noise or a tone. And mm -hmm. its level of being tolerable 
uh, depends on, you know, the, the nature of the sound. If it's a whistling, if it's a growling, if it's a, a whatever, you know, if yeah. it doesn't yeah. let you hear other tonalities, that's an issue. And so with that, if somebody tells you, I can cure this, I'd be a little skeptical. I'd if be somebody a lot says, skeptical. Yeah, if, if, <laughs> if, if somebody says, I can help you cope with this, I can yeah. help you deal with it, like a white noise machine at night so that you hear another tone. I know that audiologists have been using something that tries to match pitch the sound that you're having so that you can kind of negate it and start ignoring it. Mm -hmm. And so there's all, all kinds of possibilities, but it kind of goes into that constant search for the additional information and getting help from the appropriate provider. And so oh, again, yeah. if you have back pain and your physician says, let's do surgery, I'd suggest get a second opinion. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And not from a surgeon. They may be right, yeah. but you don't know that because you went to the surgeon and First. that's where you got the opinion. Um, and, and going, just touching on the audio thing recently, as you just talked about mm -hmm. prevention wise, if you're younger and you're noticing this starting to increase, we're hearing protection. We're wearing earplugs, you yeah. know. And there's other there's other things to look at medications, but but what we're talking about strictly here in this sense, prevention. If you start wearing earplugs, that's going to diminish the in the increased loss and maybe what you already perceive as noise will become somewhat tempered if it's not really ingrained into you just like smoking right if you smoke every day if you quit when you're 30 or 35 you're going to have a much better chance of avoiding lung cancer by the body still being able to sort of heal itself mm -hmm. and by the non-continual damage to the lungs of the carcinogen. Is there gonna be reversal? It depends on a lot of things. Probably not complete reversal, maybe a little, but certainly you will stave off the continued problem. And it goes back to the same thing we're talking about here. If you're going, if you're plucking like this, and I say straighten your wrist a little bit, and then you don't have pain and tingling in your fingers, mm -hmm. you can still do the repetitive motion because you're not doing it in a damaging way. Coming back to pain management, are there, and we talk about pills because everybody knows about those, but with topical things, we've been seeing a lot more, and, and again, the Chinese are kind of, I'll say, not famous, but one of my first exposures was like Tiger Bomb or something, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. something that, especially for muscle aches and pains, they would go with yeah. a salve or something topical that you could utilize. Yes. And a lot of times, if you have a localized pain, a topical agent can actually be a pretty useful tool. What yes. recommendations or suggestions do you have for like topical management? The number one recommendation would be to make sure it's appropriate. If your body is telling you that something is a problem and you throw a salve on there or you ice it or do something or take a bunch of aspirin or whatever mm -hmm. it may be to avoid the pain or the discomfort or the problem and the problem continues and you just keep throwing the same thing at it except increasing it more and more and more until eventually something breaks down or you create another problem. For example, if I I take aspirin every day because I have headaches every day or I have some kind of inflammation in my hand or something like that every day and I take the aspirin and that or the ibuprofen or whatever and that helps it and I do that for 10 years and I take tw oh, twice what it says on the bottle yeah. guess what I'm going to have stomach problems all uh, right and it's not going to take 10 years either that mm -hmm. was uh, an exaggeration sure. on my part certainly but now you got two issues you got the original problem which isn't being helped anymore by this problem problem and you've got a secondary problem that is perhaps internal because of this. So I think topicals are great for things like muscle soreness. For example, your back hurts. I have to adjust your back to get the alignment properly again, but it's been like this for a while. So it's going to be a little sore afterward. 
take this with you, put this on there, this will help to relax it. A topical is, by definition, something that's gonna go on the surface. Yeah. So it's gonna make you feel cooling, or it's gonna make you feel warm, or it's gonna make you feel fuzzy, or whatever, or all of the above, whatever it happens to do to make you feel better and to distract you from that soreness from that discomfort. The idea is when the problem's fixed, you don't need that stuff anymore. So I think topicals have their time and their place. I think some are better than others, certainly. Mm -hmm. But first of all, is it right for you? I would certainly rather see someone who is a musician who plays multiple sets a night and who has seen a practitioner who has helped them to sort out their issues and they still just by virtue of repetition have some soreness or have some problems that just aren't going to go away completely because that's how they make their living and they keep doing the same thing in the same fashion. Mm -hmm. If it's if that has been determined, I would much rather see someone put a topical on before, during and after a gig than ice it and just, oh yeah, it relieves everything and everything gets better because while ice has its time and its place, it's going to make things tighten up and generally any problem that you have of that type, tightness is going to be a part of it and you want to reduce the tightness in order to get better. Gotcha. So that's my thoughts on topicals. And I know when it comes to topicals, a lot of people, some of them are anesthetics themselves. You'll see like the patches that have lidocaine yes. and the intent is again, a pain killing kind of thing as deep as it can get. But yeah. also lately and, and more so because of the changes in legalities, we're seeing a lot of CBD as yeah. options. And of course, they have different approaches to administering it, whether it is ingesting in a fashion, yeah. kind of the intent of that is more anxiety and uh, you're looking at some different effects. But with some of the topical salves or ointments or foams that... Once you've done your due diligence and it, you just have, let's say you overdid it in the garden or something, or you over, you, you overdid it loading your amp into the, the trunk of your car and you know it, that you're kind yeah. of going, oh, I, I, I know exactly what I did. A lot of those will help you kind of get by. It's kind of at this point, unfortunately, just like a lot of medications based on your own experience, sometimes based on what other people have had some good fortune with and some good luck. Again, as we, with any chemical, purity is an important thing. So the conditions that things are made in, good yep. laboratories, good practices, reputable Absolute. companies, Absolute. sometimes yep. you can get some improvement. But again, we always go back to don't ignore the source of the problem. Remember that this is kind of a short-term solution. And there are one of the, the key things I think none of us really realize also with repetitive motion, there is pain patterns that are so characteristics. For example, like tennis elbow. If you are constantly doing certain motions, you can have tennis elbow. Now, you can get help from a chiropractor with that, but also there may be a, a brace or something that can help maybe with even remind you your position to stay in the right position. Back issues. I know that when you go into Home Depot or Lowe's, you'll see the employee, many of the employees wearing back braces. And yes. part of that has to do with that in their projected day, they know they're going to be doing heavy lifting. Yep. And as part of that, the brace in my mind helps to remind them to stay, keep their back straight, lift with your legs so that you're not bending and lifting at the same time. However, there are people that would argue that wearing a back brace all the time is bad because your core muscles will get weaker because you've come to depend on a back brace. And so it, it, it's kind of finding, threading the needle with that in the same, like with my tennis elbow kind of thing. If when you're doing re the repetitive motions, like if I have to do a lot of mouse work, I find if I put the little arm strap on, it just helps kind of remind me. <laughs> to, to... And that may work great for you. And there's nothing like placebo. There's nothing wrong with having something there as a reminder. 
everybody is different. I can have 10 people come in with the exact same back problem, the exact same tennis elbow, whatever it might be. And you know what? They're all going to get better differently. Whether it's, I'm going to do this kind of treatment, you're going to have to come back again. You're not going to have to come back again. You're going to have to do this. There's everybody's going to have some differences and and one set of treatment and one set of advice does not fit all. And it, and in addition, you're talking about back braces and there's certainly much to be said about should I wear that, should I not, when should I, when should I not, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is that a lot of people wearing back braces are not wearing them correctly. They're not being fitted properly. They're not wearing them in the right location. And in that case, at best, they're not helping. At worst, they may be causing another issue. As you can tell, Randy, there's this is a, a huge rabbit hole that we have gone <laughs> down. And yeah. there is certainly, we're just scratching the surface with this. So as always, yeah. People that are seeing this, if you're having pain, you're having problems, the first advice is get help from the appropriate yeah. person once you've decided that it is time to get some help. In this instance, I know Dr. Kurtz is available. People, if they want to reach you to ask you questions, what's the best way, Randy? Yes, my website, D-R-K-E-R-T-Z dot com. And there's a contact form on there which you can ask me a question about something. And I may be I may be able to help you a lot or I may be able to help you very little or steer you in the right direction. But feel free to go to my website and or search archives such as Bass Musician Mag, which has many years worth of, of videos that mm -hmm. I've done with Bass Musician Magazine that cover just about everything that one as a professional or as a, as a bassist would encounter. So there's a vast archive there available. So watch some of those videos. I have a YouTube channel, which you can also get to through the site. And again, feel free to reach out to me if you'd like. I'm, I'm happy to hear from anybody. Absolutely. And I also want to mention as a resource, as a reference, your books, again, The Basis Guide to Injury Management, Prevention and Better Health. Yes. It has valuable information. It's got some things that help people think, oh, is this what I'm looking at or is this my issue? It has, especially volume two that I'm holding in front of me right here, yes. has some sage advice from other professionals. Yes. So it, it's got input. So it's not just what Randy has to tell you. You're hearing from other people that have been in the business and how they've addressed their particular issues. So lots of valuable information. Turn to people that know more than you. Get the help. You don't have to suffer all your life. It's not just a gimme that, oh, if I'm going to be a musician, I'm doomed to just do so in absolute pain and agony. There are, <laughs> there are ways that you can do this that it will make seem it. seem that way a lot of the time. <laughs> I know. I know. But it can be done. It can be achieved when you get the right pit crew, when you get the right information, and you do the things, you follow the advice. That's the second part because people can be told this is what you need to do and they go out and do the opposite anyway. Exactly. So you, that there's, there's a, a, a back and forth part. Well, Randy, I appreciate you taking time from your schedule to share with us, folks. You've seen him here. Make sure you check out all of Dr. Kurtz's videos. Check out his books. He's a wealth for the base community and we're very grateful for everything that you do for us. You've seen him here, Dr. Randall Kurtz on Bass Musician Magazine. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Bass Musician, for all the years of friendship and, uh, and support. Mm -hmm.